<coughs> Excuse me. My, my Bible app on my phone, every day there's a verse of the day. And this morning, it was 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. I don't want to read verse 9 and 10, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. As I was thinking about that, <clears throat> to me, when we were talking about freedom, the more we embrace our weakness without thinking <coughs> that we, we are weak, if that makes sense, sure. maybe, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? That we're powerless or something. Mm -hmm. um, when we renew our minds of the fact that, yes, we are weak because we cannot do anything out of our own strength, but we're not going to let that bring us down.
really close out there. But I always pray before we go, and I always thank the Lord. And then when we're in the truck, sometimes they, they'll ask questions, not necessarily the trucking, but how you handle family issues now being away. You know, they're, they're going to be gone, they're going to be graduating soon. And I said, one thing you want to never forget is how important your family is. Right. You know, don't don't forget them. I know you got to make a living, but don't forget them. And I, that just made me think how how much God cares for his family. Yeah. I mean, that that's always that that scene where Adam and Eve and God comes walking toward the day. That is such a powerful picture mm -hmm. because they had the family there, but God was in the midst of that. Right. And that's where he's got to stay. You want peace in your home and and and, and have God. God um, that, you know, they used to have all the family that prays together, stays together. I think that's so powerful. I mean, because there could still be always a bunch of things, but the something's powerful when you get down on your knees and you pray and keep that family there and say, you know what? God's in our home. Yeah. And mm -hmm. God, God's going to be the head of our home. And that, that changes so many lives. Yeah. Yeah. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I looked up Tammy. She's home with the stomach uh, ache right now. I, I know after Friday night, um, there was a move of the Lord in this place, and sometimes it's hard for me to discern exactly uh, what the Lord's requiring of us at this point in time, and a lot of times it'll force us into our uncomfortable zone. Um, I know Roberto, I asked him to pray out in, in his native language, out, and then immediately I saw that the, the, in the spirit realm that the uh, the Hispanic-speaking uh, nations to the south of us, and even in our midst, uh, were being reached through his prayers. And Roberto, were you mentioning Friday night that you've never prayed like that before in your language? No. Okay. And then Angel come in, and I didn't know she was coming. Uh, uh, she has Southeast Asian descent, <coughs> and she cried out in her native tongue, and, and, uh, and then Sheila and others prayed out, and it just felt a release to the nations, mm -hmm. not only to the physical nations around the world, but the nations that are represented in this country, in this region, in this neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> when you start getting uncomfortable, it's normally the Lord's trying to push you out of your comfort zone, so don't <laughs> don't hesitate. <laughs> don't hesitate. Amen. it gets easier for me to pray in English than it is in Spanish. And I don't like reading the Bible in Spanish because I don't understand it. But when he asked me to do that, I hesitated for a second, but I said, well, you know, I'm just going to do it. And I felt the change yeah. in the atmosphere. So I think that, that was God telling me say what's in your heart regardless of what language you my word that you're speaking and it's going to make you so I don't know it's, it's been a little bit but it's a lot of
You've been just waiting for that one blessing, that one thing. It is here. Just say thank you, Lord, and take it and receive it as a gift, the free gift that it is. Oh, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And I receive all the blessings, all the blessings, Lord, that you have. Thank you, Lord, that your mercy is new every morning. I thank you that you transform our minds by the renewing of our minds through your word, Lord. I thank you that when we stand here together in your presence, that we are changed, that our circumstances are changed, that the atmosphere is changed, transformed, renewed forever and ever. Thank you, Lord, that it is right now on earth just exactly as it is in heaven. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and that you are good. In Jesus' name. All right, today after service, anybody that can stay, there's lots of uh, good food downstairs. So please join us for food and fellowship in the form of soup. <laughs> Let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Just hope some of that food downstairs, some of the stuff that some people's been posting the last couple days, and in my mind, been trying to convert it into soup. <laughs> I don't know yet. I've never had soup cinnamon rolls before, so.
every voice in this place sing hallelujah praise our God sing you say
Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I'm, I'm a little confused right now because I don't know what instrument to play this next song on. Kennedy, what, song, what page is that next song on? What page? 312? Y'all in the hymnals, grab 312. We're going to go for right here.
ascend into heaven and evermore will reign at the end of the age when the earth you remain. You will gather the nations before you, and the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. For with wisdom and mercy and justice you reign at your Father's side, and the angels will cry. of all kings and the Lord of all lords. With a shield, here we go. With a shield in our hand and a sword at our side, there's a part in our spirits that cannot be denied. As the Father has told us, for these you have died. For the nations that gathered before you, and the ears of all men need to hear of the Lamb who was proved. Who descended from heaven yet was raised up to reign at your Father's side And the angels will cry, Hail to the Lamb Who was slain for the world, ruling power And the earth will
His angels all around. His spirit is within us. There's healing in this room right now, no matter what you're facing. Lungs be open. Depression be gone. Let it flow, let it flow. Cry out the Lord, come Let the fountain of river flow. in him right now. Just trust in him right now. He wants to release you into the fullness of what he has for your life. So trust in him right now. Just trust in him right now. Don't be discouraged. And don't don't be distracted. Don't be distracted from the lies. Just look to Jesus. Just look to Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith and the finisher of our faith. Let his river, let his river flow through you right now. If you feel that you've been pouring out for years and you feel drained, well, guess what? The river's flowing in this place this morning to be refilled. Yes, Lord. I'll take another, Lord. Another filling, Lord. Another filling, Lord. Fill me up to overflowing, Lord. Fill me up to overflowing, Lord. If distractions of sickness have come upon you, cast that sickness into into the midst of the sea and rejoice in Him, in the finished work, in your healing. Yes, rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because there is a fountain. Sing it to them.
Thank you, Mike. Worship team, as always, praise the Lord. Appreciate it. Amen. Allowing the Holy Spirit to minister through you. Praise God. And thanks to all of you for sharing testimonies and hallelujah, encouraging us and reminding us of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, Sunday school kids, you can go if you haven't. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I want to <clears throat> talk to you this morning about the very thing that uh, Suzanne and everyone else has been sharing with us today. And that is uh, about the heard that before, praise the Lord. Uh, praise God. What about the, uh, the kingdom? And uh, how many of you know everything is finished in the kingdom? Amen. In the kingdom of God, there's healing, there's peace, there's joy, there's righteousness, there's all that, amen, that, uh, that the king has declared. Praise God. So I think sometimes because we live in this world, Mike's talking about distractions. I mean, I don't know how you can live in the world without distractions. I mean, they're just, they're constantly coming at us. We're always being bombarded with reasons to not believe, you know, arguments against, you know, why God would do this or wouldn't do that. And uh, it's so our minds have to be continuously renewed. I mean, on a daily basis, every time you turn on the news, you, you need to renew your mind or you're going to be depressed before you get out of there. Pick up a newspaper, get online, uh, just have a conversation with somebody. And, uh, you know, there's the enemies right there to try to draw you away from the promises of God. And I, I think sometimes we forget that uh, like, uh, like Abraham, wherever we go, the kingdom goes. God said, wherever you set your foot, that's yours. It belongs to you. Well, it's the way it is in the kingdom. We have received the kingdom. And uh, it came with the king. Praise the Lord. And uh, I think sometimes, though, we forget. We try, to, we try to make kingdom things work in a natural way. And it, it, it just won't work that way. So, so I think I was thinking about uh, going to England. I've never been to England. The closest I've been to England is Australia. And that's kind of a crapshoot between England and America. <laughs> it's kind of a little rebellious, you know, not quite like this prim and proper English. Uh, but nevertheless, in England, uh, there's some unique things that I think uh, apply to what I'm talking about here this morning. And that's like if you go there, if you go to England and you go rent a car and you're going to take a little road trip or you're going to go to some other city or some other town or just travel around, you get and take the car out, and down the road you go on the right-hand lane, and you're going to be dodging oncoming traffic. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a mess. You know, you have to ask, him, do you know where you're at? I mean, do you know what country you're in? You know, because this is not America. This is England. This is another country, amen. And uh, they drive on the left-hand side of the road there instead of the right-hand side. Now, I hope you're starting to see the bigger picture here. We, 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 are, we are in this world, but we're not of this world, right? So as soon as you switch sides and start driving on the left, everything clears up, right? No more dodging, no more collisions. Everything flows smoothly like it should, amen? The kingdom of God is like that. It's a different culture altogether than the world. Nothing will line up perfectly this word and the natural way of things being done in the world. That's why when you hear the news, you hear our government, you hear different things, and you think, what are they thinking? You know, why, why would they even say that or do that, you know? But it's because we've got a culture clash here. We've got two different realities, if you will, one reality and one fact coming together. 
So in order to navigate your life as a Christian, you need to make some changes. Renewing your mind, amen? You need to realize that the country we're in, realize what that is, and then move accordingly. We're in a kingdom. Yes. We're in the kingdom of God. That's what Jody was talking about, confessing, saying, saying what the kingdom says about the situation, not what, amen, this country says, amen? Learning the, the reality of us being in the kingdom, it, it makes a difference between cooperating with your surroundings and colliding with them. You know, confrontations constantly. Amen. So with that, let's look at this in Ephesians. Let, let me back up a minute, and, and let's look at this. Psalms 103, and let's read verses 7 through 12. Because I think, you know, the world wants you to believe God's ang God's mad. He's, he's, judgment's going to be poured out. We're all going to get in big trouble and have all kinds of problems. And the world is difficult and God's angry about it and all of that kind of stuff. But we need to have, we, need, we don't want to think the way the world thinks. Every time there's a windstorm, God's mad. You know, God did this. God did that. No, we live in a fallen world. But we're not of this world. We operate in another world. Amen? So he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious. This is Old Testament now. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Now people think they, the God of the Old Testament, we say Father God, Yahweh, whatever, whatever name you want to use, is different than the Jesus of the New Testament. They are one and the same. Jesus is the perfect image of God. The fullness of the Godhead dwelled in him bodily. He's God in the flesh. So there can't be a contradiction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. There has to be a misconception or a misunderstanding on our part, and the reason for that is the law. The law makes God look angry and mean when he wasn't at all. That law was to bring us to a place where these things could be realities in everybody's life. When the truth of God, who God is, what God is, how God feels about humanity, how he feels about the earth and the world and all that's in it, is different than what the average person uh, really believes. I think even Christians. God is... Look, look, all right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 and just read verses 6 and 7. Ephesians 1, 6 and 7. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, we, we're always in a debate or a, in some sort of a quandary as to what is the glory of God. I mean, where, where does, I know we think it's like this power, this, this smoke, this cloud, this uh, some kind of epiphany or something. We get a revelation and bang, we got glory. But God's trying to get us to understand what this glory is. It's revealed from the kingdom, amen, into a natural world. Praise the Lord, amen. Praise the glory of his grace when he hath made us accepted in the blood. And here's the, the, the bottom line is, God is glorified by what he does for you, not by what you do for him. Amen, we think this is gonna glorify God. No, it, it isn't gonna glorify, it might bring me a little glory or or not so much glory, but God is glorified by what he does for you, not what you do for God. So let him have his way. I mean, let him bless you. Let him heal you. Let him deliver you. Let him prosper you. Let him protect you. Let him provide for you because that gives glory to God. Amen. Amen. When I am weak, he's strong. When I can't give glory, he gets glory by blessing me, by healing me, by doing every promise, amen, that's in this book, amen. Matthew chapter 5, 
and verse 16. Now, a lot of times we, get, we read these about we're the salt, we're the light, let your light shine, don't lose your saltiness and all of that kind of stuff. But we really need to understand that God is trying to reveal something above, of himself in every scripture. This is not about you and me. This is about him. Amen? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What light? Christ's glory dwelling in you. Amen? You can't let the light shine if you think it's something you're doing. It's only his light that's going to shine. And it's his glory that he's trying to reveal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 7. If our gospel is hid, how many of you know the gospel? The gospel of grace. Amen. That's how Jesus defined it. That's how Paul defines it. It's the gospel of grace. If our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of, the God, of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, this grace, this glory, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power is of God and not us. Right. Praise the Lord. Lighten up. Take it easy on yourself. God has made this simple. Praise the Lord. He wants to do it, but he can't do it if we're in the way trying to do it. Right. Praise God. Amen. That glory came when Jesus came inside you. The light. Amen. He was that light. Right? He came in to live inside of you. He is constructing in you and in me the light of grace. If you have been graced by God, don't hide it. Don't hide it under it. Don't try to act like you're the, you know, the next best thing since Jesus. In a way, we are, but I'm saying not of our own strength. It's because of what he's done. Let people see the glory of God. Let them see the grace of God that he has extended to you. Let that be revealed to others. That's what Jesus was all about. That's what he was talking about all of his ministry. Amen? Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. There isn't, there isn't some other gospel. There isn't a bunch of other. There can only be one gospel. If, it's, if gospel is good news, if gospel is the truth, then there can't be a bunch of them. There can only be one. Here's what they, Paul said, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, we can stand out here on the street corner from now till Jesus comes and scream at cars going by telling them how much God loves them. <laughs> Amen. That's me trying to get some light to them, Right? But I have no revelation of myself. Any revelation we get has come from that light, from that revelation of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who has come to reconcile us back to himself. Because man dropped the ball. He had to pick it up and put us back where we belong. Amen. This is about what we already have. Praise the Lord. Great. What, what, what do we have to do then? We, we have to start being grace Believers, grace instinctive, grace thinking. In other words, this is what we're talking about when we're confessing the word. What are we doing? We're, we're talking, in a way, at odds with our natural man. Yeah. By his stripes, yeah. I'm healed. I was healed, amen. When all of my natural man is saying, no, you're not healed because you've got all these symptoms. Yeah. Or it's, I am financially blessed but I'm speaking from a reality, a kingdom reality, that has come to me by his word, and I'm professing this in the face of this natural world that's saying, you idiot, you just bounced a check, you know, or this bad thing happened, or that thing happened, or 
All of my relationships are made whole, and you, you, you're as dysfunctional as you can get in the natural. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We have to think grace. We have to believe grace. We have to instinctively respond to situations and, 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 and issues by grace. This isn't punishment. How, how, why would God punish his favorite son? Why would God punish his spoiled kid that he's just done everything to bless? Why would God do that? The only way we could think that he does it is because we don't believe we are that special child of God, that we have received a, not only a king, but his kingdom. And in his kingdom, he supplies everything. Like in any uh, uh, king uh, type of reign, the government, I'm talking about originally, now we don't have any real true monarchies anymore. They're all some kind of mixture of, of uh, republics and, and democ democracies or, or uh, other types of government that are uh, uh, more subversive, more, more controlling. But they still, under the original, the, the true kings, they provided everything in the kingdom. And whatever they said goes. If it hadn't been a law before it came out of their mouth, once it came out of their mouth, it was now a law. We have received a king and a kingdom. And what he says goes. Yes. We've got to believe it. We've got to live from that reality and from that truth. Amen? We, we need to recapture this simple wonder. Amen? that is taught throughout the scripture. The glory of God is His grace. Praise the Lord. Not what you do for Him works, but what He does for you. Grace. Hallelujah. Your sins won't deter Him. Your faithlessness will not depress Him. He knows the end from the beginning. You're not going to surprise Him with the next stupid thing we do. Your weaknesses don't surprise him. Your tantrums don't shock him. Anybody ever had a Jesus tantrum? Well, you just got mad because things have not happened the way they're supposed to happen. That's what your word says. Why not? Why is it not happening? God doesn't get all nervous and uptight and say, oh, how disrespectful. He knows our frame. He's been a man. He knows the weakness. He knows the challenges. He knows what it is to have to believe in the face of all the unbelief. Amen? God is eternally satisfied with you. You need to remind yourself of that multiple times a day. Forever, God is satisfied with you. It's God's joy to bless you. That's what Suzanne was talking about. It's God's joy to bless you better than you deserve. He's not grudging. He's not human to be in the sense that uh, being cheap or, or to withhold simply because eh, maybe I won't have enough tomorrow. I'll give you it, but he's total He's completely about you. I know this, this makes us a little nervous in the religious respect because we think, well, that's egotistical. That's self-centered. That's not, not if it's him that's doing it. I'm not trying to manipulate it. That's just the way it is. Amen? I can't help being spoiled if he spoils me. Amen? I can't help expecting good things if that's all I've ever known. Amen? If I know he, he suffered, he paid a horrendous price for me to not be sick. Not a little. Everything. He gave everything so that we could experience the joy of the Lord. So we could understand where that joy comes from. It's not my joy. It's his joy. He gets pleasure from blessing us. Or he wouldn't have done it. Praise the Lord, Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he gave 
the most important, most valuable, best, A1, top, if he was willing to give that, why do we have such a problem believing that he's going to give us everything else? If he gave himself, or in the, you know, in, in the, the natural way of looking at this, his son, the, the, the fleshly reality of him, then why would we think that he wouldn't give us healing? Why would we think that he'd want to withhold financial breakthrough or, or blessing from us? Because we don't think kingdom thoughts. We think some kingdom, some natural. Amen. We start thinking that doesn't make sense right. for me to just expect this and that it's going to happen. Right. Let me tell you something. Angels are amazed. Angels are, are dumbfounded. They want to understand why God has this endless grace for us. I'm talking about fallen angels and not fallen angels. They're all really confused about this. The scripture even says, look at this in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 10 through 12. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Now, it's, you got, I mean, we think of angels as being you know, because they're so powerful and, and, and with God in the, in the natural sense, in the physical sense, we see them as so much greater than us. The truth is, we know a lot of things they don't know. Or they wouldn't want to be looking into us and trying to figure this out. Praise the Lord. The day's coming when we're going to judge them. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto us, or you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Praise the Lord. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Praise the Lord. I promise there is not an angel in heaven that would not gladly trade places with you. And for sure the day is coming when there's not a demon in hell that wouldn't give anything to trade places with you. Demons spit and fume that God should love you so much. You talk about a sibling rivalry, bitterness, hatred. Just, you want to know why the devil comes? Because he hates God and he hates the fact that God loves you and is willing to do everything for you. He's the, he is the height, the epitome of jealousy, greed, hatred. Amen? The devil roars. The Bible even says the gates of hell tremble. The universe is literally on the edge of its seat. We have this great cloud of witnesses. Human, angelic, all of, all of, all of heaven sits on the edge of its seat in excitement for the day when the grace of God explodes in a display that will amaze the cosmos forever, for eternity. And we have it right now in this earthen vessel. Oh, man. But I'm telling you, it can be seen now, and it will be seen for eternity. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. Uh, verses 19, Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Verse 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of of the children of God, animals, plants, everything. 
Everything will experience grace. Everything will reflect grace. Hallelujah. Grace will be the theme of eternity for saints, for angels, for every bit of creation. It'll be a celebration forever. So it has to become the great theme of the church. If it's going to be what God is celebrating and what he, the reality of, uh, of his creation celebrates for eternity, don't you think it would be a good idea that it became the theme for us? Don't you think it ought to be the priority of the children of God, of his body? When grace fills our heart, God's glory fills our world. I, I'm of the opinion that the reason we haven't seen the kind of, uh, and I'm not saying there haven't been revivals, there haven't been revelations, and so on and so forth, but the reason we haven't got to the place where God can come back, because he's waiting for the fullness of time, the reason is not because not enough time has elapsed, but because we haven't given a true picture that we haven't really experienced the one thing that will exist for eternity, the grace of God. It's not about our religion. It's not about our denomination. It's not about our good works. It's about his grace. And till that is known, till, the, till we know it and believe it, it can't be released in any meaningful way into this world. All of the world, it says, it'll cover, the glory of God is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. I, I've thought about that, and I think I even talked about it one time. How, does, how do you get water to cover water? How does that work? How many know whenever you look at the scriptures, when it talks about seas, many waters, it's talking about people. His glory is released and revealed because of his grace that's in us. And it will be so vivid and so real and so true that it will cover the entire earth because everywhere there's a human being, his grace will have reached. His grace will have touched. Hallelujah. And God will be glorified. Praise the Lord. I said God is glorified by what he does for you, not by what you do for him. And until we understand that, we don't understand our purpose for even being here. We've thought it's been about do, 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 good, 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 work, work, work. And it's not about any of that never has been about any of that. Until we understand that, we don't understand our purpose. We're just flailing around out here trying to do good stuff, thinking that's going to win people to Jesus. On the basis of the Word of God, I set you free from trying to glorify God by your own good deeds based on this word, not just my words, just not me saying something to sound like I've got some power. I'm just saying, here's the anointing, here's the power. You cannot be not anointed if you're preaching the word of God. Right. Amen? Because right. it's already anointed. Right. It has taken on a life of its own, a reality of its own. Praise the Lord. So, because of that, I have authority based on this word. It's not mine. I can't just pick it up. You've got the same authority if it's based on this word. And based on this word, I can then say, I, therefore, in the name of Jesus, set you free from your effort, from your hard work, from your trying to glorify God by your own help, by your own works, by your own effort. Yes. Be free. Yes, Lord. He's glorified by what he does for you not what you do for him. So what does that mean for you? If you want to glorify him more. Because we want to glorify him. It's just that we fail when it's in the natural, in our works. It can't glorify him. So if he is glorified by what he does for us instead of what I do for him, how am I supposed to give him glory? If God's glory is his grace then it's simple. I just focus myself on his grace. I just say, thank you, Jesus. Amen? I'm expecting something great to happen today. Why? Because of his grace. Yes. I didn't pray any more yesterday than I did the day before. I did pray, but I didn't spend an hour and a half, two hours on my knees somewhere doing it. I'm not saying that's wrong or we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that gives us the impression 
somehow, that that's going to move God to do something for me that he wouldn't do otherwise. I already know if I'm not praying this, I'm not getting it anyhow. Right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But if I am, if this is what I believe, then every time I turn to my father, it's like a prayer. Yes. I, I'm having faith. I have an expectation of good from God because he's good, because he can't do anything else but good. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Make a big deal of the cross. Make a big deal of what it means. He, it, it's, it has provided us an inheritance. Make a big deal out of that. By his stripes I was healed. Amen? He became sin that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He suffered. Amen? So I don't have to suffer. He became poor that I could be rich. Shed the, the legalistic skin and just wrap yourself up in a God of all grace. And while you're doing it, be yourself. Be yourself. You, you don't have to be I don't know how to say. I mean, sometimes there are some people that you just know they can't be that good. <laughs> you know, really spiritual, always using the Christian lingo and the right thing and the right. I, I, you know, don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to judge. I'm just saying I, I see that sometimes I just go, well, that's just nice for them, but I don't see that attracting people who are struggling with sin, that are, that are devastated by their life situations and thinking that there's no answer from God unless I look and act like that. He's glorified by what he does for you, not by what you do for him. So what does that mean? Well, it means we need to trust him. We need to believe him. We need to expect the good to come from him. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. That's why we ought to be the happiest people. That's why we ought to have the joy. Hey, there's no, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There is no pressure on us. None. <laughs> We make pressure situations. We, we create environments that are tense and, and, and rigid and frightening when God's just trying to get us to relax and enjoy the freedom that the Son has given us. Amen? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's Paul saying. Be yourself. You don't have to be Paul. Amen? You don't have to be John. You don't have to be Peter. Be you. Just be comfortable with you, and God will use you to reach people that Paul couldn't reach, that Peter can't reach, that John couldn't reach, but you can reach. Yes. I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Now, that's, a, that's just like, you know, the, the Galatians. Who's bewitched you? Having begun in the Spirit, having all of this has been given to you, now you think you're going to work and earn somehow favor with God and good things from God and blessings from God? No. He said, it was bestowed upon me. It was not in vain. I'm receiving it. I'm getting it. I'm taking it. I'm going to enjoy every bit of it. Amen. But I labored more abundantly than they all. And it's almost like, I know this isn't what he meant, but when I read it, I sometimes think, oh, he forgot what he just said. Right? But he... Fixes it right away, because immediately after he says it, he goes, oh, well, that didn't sound right. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. I mean, it, to somebody else, it might have looked like I was really going after it. But the truth is, I really wasn't doing anything. I was just resting and trusting God, and God was opening doors, allowing this to happen, telling me to move here, to go there. Don't go into Macedonia right now. You can go there later. I got another plan for you. You know what I'm saying? He could just relax and trust God. That way, whenever he found himself in a negative situation in the natural, he didn't have to freak out. Right. To live is Christ, to die is gain. The worst they can do to me is punch my ticket. Yeah. Amen. Validate my parking. I'm out of here. Praise the Lord. So it's all good. If we understand what it is he's trying to tell us. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 
and verse 7. Nobody wants their children. I, I grew up, and please, I've said this stuff before, and I don't want it to sound like I'm disrespectful of my parents, because I'm not. It was a different generation. They, were, they grew up during the Depression. My dad uh, was born in 1910. My mother was born in uh, 1923. And uh, I was born in the 40s. So I don't necessarily deal with my children the way I sometimes have natural ways of thinking. In other words, not the way I was raised. <laughs> now, I'm not saying my way is better or that it's right. It's just I know that other one wasn't right. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? And it's not fun to be, you know, in an in a environment, a home environment, where you're not comfortable coming up to a parent and just giving them a hug or just saying, I love you. It just wasn't done. We just didn't do that. Now, it wasn't because my parents didn't love me or it just that they never, they never experienced it, so they had no way of relating that beyond. They just thought, I need to teach you how to be a big kid. I, I need to teach you how to grow up and be responsible and, and do all the right stuff. But see, that gives us an image then but that's the way God is. God is just a demanding God, a God of saying, okay, here's your orders. Do it good. Do it right. And I'll be all right. We'll, we'll be okay. It'll all be cool. If you don't, then there's going to be repercussions. There's going to be punishment. There's going to be uh, consequences, you know. God is not that way. God went ahead and did all the stuff that we were asked to do. Amen? Amen. He already took out the trash. He already mowed the yard. He already went to the gas station. He already did this. He already did, he already did all the stuff ahead of time and said, thank you. Great work. But I didn't go anywhere. Ah, but you were in me before the foundation of the world. And because you believed in me, now I declare my work to be your work. There's no more work for you but to believe that I've already done a perfect job of this. And you can come boldly to the throne of grace anytime you want a hug. Anytime you want to, I love you from dad. You know, anytime you want to pat on the back and say, good job, kid. You know, that was, you, you did it good. I'm proud of you. That's what God is saying to us every day, every minute. But it's hard to grasp when we haven't had that natural experience to relate it to. That's why we have to have our minds renewed. We are no longer in this world. We are of another world. We're in it, but we're not of it. We don't operate by its rules. We don't operate by its reactionary kind of way of doing things. Amen? In the ages to come, he did this. Why? So that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us. I'm the badge. I'm the gold star. I'm the pat on the back. I'm how God is showing his riches of his grace to everybody and to anybody. Look at that. That's my kid. I'm well pleased. He's done a great, and they're going, what? Grace is so that he can show the exceeding riches of his grace in his, because of his kindness towards us in Christ. Do not be one of these, oh, oh no, I, I couldn't accept that from you, Lord. That's a slap in the face. That's like, I'm not letting any glory come out. Of, I'm not letting anybody see your goodness in me. I, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let them see my goodness, but I'm not going to let them see yours. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, just leave that up. There. That'll be the last scripture, Sheila, so just leave it there. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Now, here, here's, I think, what we need to, to get from this. Christ's greatest glory and our greatest gift is always going to be his blood-bought grace. 
every, the, the greatest glory that God gets is our greatest gift. That's why it's not so wrong to say, thank you, Lord, I'll have another. Or my name is Jimmy, I'll take all you give me. I mean, we make jokes about that, but that's the truth of it. That's how God is glorified. That's God's plan, not my plan, although I, I think it's a great plan. It was his. And what I'm saying to you is get in the right lane. You know, we're, we're, we're having collisions. We're, having, we're trying to avoid stuff all the time. When we ought to just relax. Just get in the right lane. Just get into Jesus. Just trust Jesus and go. You could be on the Audubon. Just go, man. Go. Don't worry about it. You're in the flow. Mike calls it the river. You know, we're in the flow of the river if we just trust in Him, in His grace. When do we do? I'm going to just speak for me, okay? You can inject yourself in here, but this is the way I see it. Eternal glory shines more brightly because God forgave a wreck like me. All I had to do was be the wreck. All I had to do was get born. All I had to do was be human and dysfunctional like every human being there is. And because of God's grace, for eternity, God will be glorified because of me. Tell me he isn't willing to share. He'll share his glory with you. Why? Because you and him are one. He'll not share his glory with another, but he doesn't have a problem sharing it with you. Praise the Lord. Think about this. The Father, God, the eternal God, smiles brighter today because of me. Angels sing louder in heaven because of me. Heaven's happiness is greater because I'm there in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father in Jesus. You think that's that's too much? No. This is the complete unbridled truth of the Bible. We don't have to feel humiliated and less. We can come boldly because God, through me, is saying, this is how good I am. He was lost, but now he's found. He was worthless. Now he's of the most high value, so valuable that I, God, your creator, gave my life for him. Tell me angels aren't shouting over that, trying to even figure it out, but shouting over it because all it's telling them is this God that we've served for eternity and will serve for eternity is a good God. He's a righteous and a holy God, and he's a God that loves. Praise the Lord. There's a scripture in, uh, I, I won't go back there because I've already said I wouldn't, but in, in uh, uh, Psalms, I think it's Psalms 15. Anyway, he says, he goes on about his mercy and his love. That word mercy there is literally translated grace under the old covenant because God's grace, because of that grace, he will not cast me off. He will not turn his back on me. He will not give up. Hallelujah. Undeserving as I am, unworthy as I know myself to be, I've been made worthy. Praise God. I've been qualified for the endless kindness of God with our whole selves. The redeemed are going to glorify our Savior. I always think about, oh, we're all going to be up there just praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We are the praise of the Lord. Every time God blesses you, every time God delivers you, every time God heals you, His glory is being revealed. And throughout eternity it will. For all of eternity. We, the redeemed, 
will glorify God forever. His grace is His glory. They're inseparable. I can't imagine how I missed that for years. Not that I didn't understand His grace, but never to the extent that everything God does for me he does it for me because he loves me, but he does it also because it brings glory to him. He cannot help himself. And eternity, the creation, everything will be a testimony to the goodness of God. When we have our testimonies here before services, I, I've been thinking the last few weeks, I think, you know, this is kind of like the best part of the service for God. Because every time, every time God does something for us, listen to what I'm saying, it is praise to God. I don't, I don't have to open my mouth because every time I get healed, every time I get delivered, every time I get saved, every time I get, you know, protected, provided for, it's a praise to God. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't praise God or that we shouldn't acknowledge it. I'm just saying everything sees this. Everything in the supernatural realm sees what's going on in the kingdom. And they're constantly being reminded every time God's grace is released to us, his glory goes forth. We're walking glory clouds. Amen. When you, when you, take, when you come in here and this has got to be like this, and that's got to be like that. You suck the, the glory right out of the room. And with it, the grace. And the opposite of that is true, too. When you really begin to talk about, live your life based on His grace, glory just happens. The glory of God will fill your temple. And it will do it. Why? So that you cannot do anything. Remember? Remember? The glory, God came, the, the, the glory of God filled the temple and the priests were unable to do their work. It was a type, it was a shadow, it was showing us what the grace of God was all about. Amen, it wasn't about the effort of men, it was about God's presence, amen, in a man would bring his glory amen. and cause us to trust and rest in his grace. Ever, you know, people think, well, you know, that's just, you're just asking for trouble. I'm not asking for anything. I'm just telling you what God said. You can do what you want to with it. But I'm saying the reason we have not progressed, my opinion, the reason the church hasn't progressed to the extent that it should have is because this hasn't been our theme. This hasn't been our focus. It's, been, it's always been a peripheral thing. It's been a little something with this, and then it'll happen. One more big deal that we do, and then bang, it's all going to happen. No, that isn't the way it works. Praise the Lord. Give it up. Rest. Cease from striving. Sit down, Martha. Stand still, Moses. Take a nap, Elijah. Huh? Fear not, disciple. It's the theme of the Bible. It's everything God's trying to tell us. His glory is hidden in His grace. When God blesses, when God gives, when God provides, when God loves, when God saves, when God keeps, then God is praised. Hallelujah. We ought to have the joy of the Lord. We ought to be the happiest people, the most joyous people, the most peaceful people. Because it is finished. Amen. And we are the little gold lapel pin Lord's robe saying good job
Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. We can say that right now. We don't have to wait until they throw dirt in our face. Amen? Enter into the kingdom right now. Enter in. Good and faithful. Anybody been really good, been really faithful all your life? I've never been unfaithful. Never been not good. Well, that's what Roberto was saying. Jesus was perfectly good. Why call you me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. Amen? He did it all very good. And then counted it to me as righteousness. And then he turns to me and says, Enter in, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Be a joy of the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. So give it up. Amen. Be you. And love it for God's sake. Amen. Every time he does something for you, it's a praise to God. Angels are looking. We're looking over. There he is. He's doing it again. Praise the Lord. Amen. He is a good God. There is none like him. He alone is worthy. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He gives his children rest. Anybody ever have trouble sleeping? Ever had issues that just kind of keep you awake? Or, or you get to sleep and then you wake up in the middle of the night and it's just going a million miles an hour. Why? Because I think I got something to do with it. But if I know it's already taken care of, he gives me sleep. He gives me rest. He gives me peace. And that's what he wants for all of us to experience. Dump the load. You know, get the burden. All those that are weary, heavy laden, come unto me. I'll give you rest. That's what he wants. Rest in his perfection and be received as though it were our own. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Let me pray and then we can go down and eat. I appreciate everybody again for being here. Thank you for whatever you've brought. If you've brought, if you haven't come and eat anyway, there's more than enough, I'm sure, for everybody. There always is. So we'd love to have you stay and talk a little bit, enjoy the soup or whatever. And uh, so, Father, we just thank you so much for your grace. Thank you that your glory is shown through us by your grace. We just bless you, Lord, and thank you so much. There's so much that you do every moment of every day that we're not even aware of. But, Father, we're just so thankful that you are a good God, that you're a loving God, that you've just chosen to grace us with your glory. Now, we ask you to bless the food that's been prepared, bless those that prepared it, and all of us though, that will uh, consume it, hallelujah. And thank you, Lord, for uh, family, church, and fellowship that reflects you and your reality. Bless us now as we uh, have this time of uh, eating and celebrating you with one another. And we'll ask it and believe it in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 God bless you. Go get some soup. See you in a few minutes.